Hi there, this is James Chai, RFRF Park Park Rescue Foundation, registered nonprofit, and I'm the guy that works with extremely dangerous dogs, predatorial dogs. I read dogs at two tenths of a second, and I am reading them at their psychogenetic root, understanding the nuanced behavior of dogs at a speed and accuracy that is 100%. There's nobody in the world that works at my level. I do not train dogs. I only focus on the evaluation, the determining of uh, the issues that are the underlying psychological issues of dogs. Uh, if you have any questions about the accuracy of my work or my ability, please feel free to go check out my website, rfrfbarkbark.com. Check out the tab that says help for your dogs. You'll see screenshots of what I've done with dogs uh, in regards to um, reading people's uh, uh, descriptions, looking at the photos of their dogs and being able to accurately describe their dog's personality as well as remedy the situations that go on with their dog and how to address it. Uh, what a lot of people will say, sorry, just clear this off my screen here. Uh, a lot of people say in these dog training reactive dog groups that it's impossible to do this all online, to do it over the uh, over the internet, whatever it is, to be able to decipher a dog's uh, reactionary aspects. Uh, for me, as you can see with, with my um, my website screenshots and so forth like that, I have 100% accuracy. It is 100% possible for a lot of us to read and to uh, intuit the issues that uh, behaviorally that our dogs have. Uh, you see in the description today is uh, October 8th, 2019. This is broadcast vlog episode number 14. A couple of the main topics will be your dog falling two steps backwards which is when you have progress with your dog and suddenly it seems as if your dog has just gone off the handle and uh, fallen two steps backwards. And the other one is a preventing immediate dog on dog attack. In the other words of a dysfunctional dog being reactive to another dog, uh, a dog that comes into your home if you are adding on to your pack. Uh, I wanna thank uh, to a few people, Jude Witt and um, um, a couple other people as well who have been sharing uh, my posts, I really appreciate it. Uh, Shu Young, Shu Young, Shu Wong. Sorry, I'm sorry, I just murdered your 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 name there. I, I apologize. I want to thank you as well for sending me a, a beautiful note, um, thanking me for uh, the pro bono work that I'm doing. And uh, again, the links are in my description uh, for my uh, YouTube, Instagram, and Twitter. Uh, please follow those. That would be great. Help spread and share my word. The more people that do understand and are spreading out what I am doing will learn and be able to share with the rest of our dog training community how simple it is to truly address dogs on a psychological level without treats, without medication, literally just by connecting to our dogs intuitively like evolution has been able to provide for us uh, instinctively, intrinsically, how to read dogs, how to read people. Uh, we can do that again with everyone else, how we are... Um, uh, able to do that. Uh, there's a couple other links too, as well to donations. If you are, uh, if you have a couple of bucks kicking around, that'd be great. I don't take pop cans, no soda cans. I'm sorry, but uh, if you do have a couple of dollars that you'd love to help support what we're doing here by uh, doing the broadcasting vlogs and being able to help, um, you know, help other people who do need help. And uh, I do all this. It takes me between four to six hours a day just to get this going. I have to figure out what it is that I want to talk about when I'm not working. Uh, for example, I want to figure out what I want to talk about, break out the topics, uh, go through my head a little bit, get a bit more formalized, and then spend an hour, hour and a half online, you know, uh, posting live, and then up to two to three hours afterwards, reviewing everything that I wrote, uh, that I said, and writing down key points so people can track that in the future. And uh, it is a lot of work, it's a lot more work than I actually thought it would be, or I, I guess I had uh, delusions that it was just going to be really straightforward. But it seems that uh, a lot of people are really interested in what I'm doing, uh, which is flattering. Um, you know, I'm an introvert, as I've said before in the beginning. So this is quite a bit of a, uh, of a thing to do. But again, my focus is on helping the dogs and uh, owners and helping families stay a little bit more healthier and healed together instead of fighting uh, over their dog being reactive and getting a lot of stress. So that's there as well. Um, some of the things that I'll go over. Uh, I'm just going to go over the points and I'll just kind of go back to it as well. Uh, so some of the points uh, that I've written in my descriptions are regards to um, vlogging instead of commenting. Uh, commenting. Uh, always ask for photos. Your dog falling two steps backwards. They are progressing forward when your dysfunctional dog has hit a plateau. Recognizing positive progress. Resetting your dog. Always talk normal for at least seven seconds. Use your dog's name only. 
ticklish reactive hypersensitivity. Some dogs don't eat their meal, cereal without milk, introducing a new dysfunctional dog into your existing family of dogs. And of course, the next topic here is the things that I primarily deal with is uh, the dangerous and uh, extremely dangerous and predatorial dogs, is the importance of preventing immediate dog on dog attack, as well as watching for, uh, uh, watching for opportunistic or predatorial nuances in our dog's behavior. So again, I don't train dogs. I don't do the obedience and so forth like that. I don't do trick training. I don't do agility, no show, etc. It is uh, it's something that's uh, a lot more intensive for, uh, for, for people who are much more proficient on my end. I do the psychological evaluation. And dogs do suffer from psychological behavioral, right? It's the issues that cause them to be reactive and aggressive. Uh, that's why, again, your vet would prescribe your dysfunctional dog medication, psychopharmaceuticals, uh, to address the psychological issues. So instead, what I do is I decipher, I explain to you the nuanced behavior of your dogs, be, uh, you know, why they're reactive and so forth. Bring it down to the dysfunction, bring it down to, to uh, confidence issues, bringing it down to dependency issues, right down to the root. And again, if you know why somebody hurts, you can help them. Same with our dogs. And I've said this before as well, if you get a phone call from somebody and they're talking to you a little bit odd on the phone one day, you know them so well and you can hear them talking to you and they and they're kind of sound a little bit odd in their voice, but they don't say anything. And then a few days later, you find out that their mom died. And they go, oh, now I understand why they were kind of like a little bit odd. And then after knowing that your friend's mom has died, you will spend time to help them heal. So when it comes to our dogs, these are our codependents. These are our dedicated, loyal to their death, defending us dogs. This is what I do. I tell you, I figure out for you how to decipher that. Um, and then I'll be going through some members' questions uh, from my closed uh, reactive dog group, which you are all welcome to join. The link is in my, my description. And then some possible other discussions, which I've had uh, from beforehand. I'm going to eliminate them back and forth. Uh, a couple of new things I do... I uh, think that I will start working on is uh, two very important things to any dog owner, any parent, dog parent, is how to prepare for, uh, um, you know, it's a big topic, uh, tough topic for me to say again, um, how to prepare yourself for your dog's death. And the other one is how to prepare your dog for their own death. Never heard of that before because it's a psychological aspect that has not been recognized and how to prepare for that. And it's the same thing in regards to the cost aspect for people who are dying. Um, they have to prepare for their own death. And how do they do that? So dogs obviously can't go and say, hey, you know what, I'm just going to just, I'm going to die. Um, and it's not the power of, uh, not the part of where the do your dog just walks off into the bushes and dies. This is actually preparing your dog for their own death. Uh, so that you don't cause panic in them, as well as preparing ourselves as parents for the death of our dogs, uh, as well. And as a lot of you know, um, you know, most recently, uh, I had my um, my beloved Great Dane Nero Chai uh, die um, on June 11, 2019. I, I got him at 10 years, four months of age, from a very bad life, extremely reactive, extremely dangerous dog, and uh, he lived for three additional three years three months longer with me dying at the age of 13 years seven months one week old and so um i don't know if i'm gonna have time to go over that today it's a little bit uh very personal for me and it's uh it's a bit difficult to talk about that especially publicly um but um i will try to get to that uh either today if not it might be a full episode on its own uh um so we'll do that. So I'm going to go back to uh, to the top here and just going to start on a few things. Uh, so I'm going to start vlogging uh, onto the post. Uh, you know, people will pose questions in, in my closed group and even in the uh, my page itself, uh, commenting on what I've done or what I've talked about. And, and they'll say, well, you know, what do you think? Or what should I do? Or, hey, I got a problem. And, and so it's actually easier for me to talk about it than to write it out. Because if I have to write it out, then I have to spend time to use an efficient amount of words and not to over talk it and not to make it too confusing for people. And, you know, sometimes when I write a comment out, it'll, you know, for example, if I read someone's post about their dog, it'll take me less than five minutes to know what exactly their dog's issues are with 100% accuracy. But then it takes me like 20, 30 minutes to figure out how to 
do I explain this in human terms and psychological terms and using human analogies of what the issues are and sometimes it can take me even an hour just to write out something that would take me five minutes to explain so uh, I will probably migrate to the the vlogging of uh, of evaluation and going forth uh, if anybody knows how to do a podcast please let me know I'd be 100% interested in doing a podcast uh, where I can do some live uh, dog training evaluations, psychogenetic uh, evaluations of their dogs and being able to work that. As all you can see, the stuff in the newspaper coverage and national television coverage of my work, uh, obviously I know what I'm doing and I would just be able to love to share this. So if anybody wants to do that, be happy to go in that. I think we could also make it kind of a commercial success as well because, um, uh, you know, I know what I'm doing. I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, fortunately, thank you to God uh, that I'm still alive. I have not been killed by some of the most uh, gigantic, extremely dangerous dogs, etc. So uh, vlogging instead of commenting. Uh, the other thing is always make sure wherever you are, uh, if you have to go hire a trainer or behaviors, uh, don't tell them anything. Don't say anything to them. Have a talk with them. You know, send them an email. Have them respond to you and wait for them to ask you your dog's name. If the trainer or behaviorist doesn't ask you for your dog's name, just bad sign already. Uh, second part is if you send your uh, that trainer behavior uh, a description of your dog and say you just send like a couple of sentences or whatever. If that trainer behavior does not ask you for more information, more detailed information, more paragraphical, concise, clear information on your dog, that's a bad sign. If your trainer behavior does not ask you for a photo of your dog, that's a very bad sign. Not just a bad sign, it's a very bad sign. And you say, well, you know what, dog's a dog. And you look at the trainers and behaviors that are in some of these groups that are, uh, you know, highly accredited or, or highly well known. And, uh, you know, I've had people who've gone to some of these people here on a local basis or a national basis. And I'll say, well, did they ask you for this or that? And they go, no, they didn't ask me for, for uh, detailed information about my dog. They didn't ask me for pictures of my dog. They didn't even ask me for my dog's name. That's a big mistake. How do you connect? How do you heal someone's dog? How do you heal a dog's psychological issues if you don't even have a description of what's going on? So it's important that our dog trainers and our dog behaviors, our animal behavioral scientists, our academics, our Temple Grandins, our Dean Dunbars, our Karen Priors, all these people who have this uh, the, this the uh, um, uh, reputations it's very important that people like that are asking for information and you say to yourself well James why is it so important to get a description of your dog well hey if I don't know the details of what's going on with your dog's dysfunctions how do I figure out what's going on I, I'm not gonna guess I'm not gonna do a disservice nor am I going to treat your dog in your 100% extreme concern for your dog's behavior because that's why you're reaching out to a trainer of behaviors or uh, an academic if I'm not asking for those details about your dog. So then I have a full understanding, a full color, a full painting of what the issues are for your dog. So again, trainers, behaviors, you guys out there, uh, take a note from me, ask for your dogs, uh, your client's dogs, uh, photos, descriptions as well. And you'll see as the more often you do that, and even you guys yourself, your owners, uh, parents, uh, so forth, you'll see that once you start working on that level, you'll see that there's a much more visceral, emotional connection to your dog's behavior, which makes it more of an understanding. Uh, ask for the photos, and the reason why I ask for the photos of uh, people's dogs, clear photos, and if there's like flash or whatever, I say, you know what, I, I can't see it. You've got to send me clear photos. If your dog has dark eyes and dark fur, I, I say to them, get it out in some nicer light it doesn't have to be you know recent photos it can be a couple of weeks a month old as long as i can see the dog's eyes we can see the facial structure of the way the dog has grown the way the eyebrows have developed uh, physically how the dog holds themselves physically as well as well as the body wise there's few people out there who can attest that i've read their dogs uh, physical behaviors and sometimes medical issues just by the the way they've carried their body and again it's the same thing like us you know if we've got a rock in our shoe we're going to have a somewhat of a limp to our, our, to our walk, but we don't really show it because it's not, you know, like if it's a pebble and then someone goes, hey, you're walking kind of funny today. Same thing, same thing like talking to your friend on the phone and you hear something out on their voice and it turns out their mom died. All of this stuff is very important. Another reason why 
is when you decided to adopt your dog or buy your dog from a breeder, uh, hopefully a, a, a reputable breeder that's, you know, not a backyard breeder, not those fly-by-night people who, who raise dogs because they think they would love to raise dogs and have the world have more of their own dogs and make money off their dogs. And then a lot of these backyard breeders use the money that they make to buy drugs, to buy garbage, to, to, to just uh, uh, screw the system over, not pay their taxes in that sense of it. Uh, a lot of these backyard breeders will uh, breed dogs that they know, like double murrow dogs. Um, anybody who has that knows what I'm talking about. These are dogs that end up, uh, a lot of the litter will have dogs that are blind and or deaf, which is an incredibly cruel thing to do. And the politicians know this all happens and they just go, well, we don't care. So it, it is that part that we have to have a moral compass. And this is why I'm doing all this stuff here. Uh, a lot of my focus, again, is on the dysfunctions of the dogs, on the more deeper rooted aspects of it and uh, going from there. So asking for photos, when you look at the first pictures of that one dog that you were going to adopt, you fell in love with that dog. They're photos. You didn't just, just close your eyes and go, yeah, I'm going to pick this dog over here. You looked at each photo and went, you know what? I like this one. And out of a hundred dogs that you've looked at, this one particular dog is the one that brought to you uh, that that emotional joy. Um, okay, so we're, we're going to do that part. And then I want to say thank you to Awesome Mastiff Lovers Group on Facebook uh, for contacting me yesterday and inviting me to be part of their group and to provide uh, uh, training advice, uh, down training advice and information. Uh, you'll see that I use the term down training. And people go, oh, you know, I've got the, my, my trolls and critics go, down training? What? There's no such word as down training. And, I'm, and I explain to them, you know what, why don't you use your logic? Because the fact that you're saying you're training a dog, you're training a dog to do this and that, and your dog learns these tricks and all that. A dysfunctional dog, a higher level of dysfunctional dog, they have those behavioral issues that are right up there. So what do we do? We take them down by training the dog down down training the dog so it's my term my terminology hey maybe in 20 30 years people will go you know what james chai uh he's the one that that figured it out that it's actually called down training and again we want to be able to understand the the process the the, the direction of taking a dog psychologically that is a high level of dysfunction down training. and the interesting thing too is the fact that my terminology is finally starting to kind of get locally understood here in Vancouver where people are actually saying things like, yeah, I, uh, you know, I heard that you deal with dogs that have behavioral issues and dogs that are dysfunctional. And then they start using terms, which is interesting because I have uh, a lot of my trolls and some of them are watching this as well, which is hilarious because they, they have mercilessly attacked me. And then they're starting to use my terminology that I'm finding. I'm like, well, how did they hear about this? And I'm like, okay, obviously. Uh, they're watching my my vlogs, which is a great compliment. Um, but you know, please stop attacking me. That's not cool to be hypocritical. But again, these people are using terms like higher level dysfunctional dogs. So it makes sense. Doesn't matter how much you may not like me. Everything that I'm talking about makes sense. Everything that I'm talking about is rooted in over fourteen hundred days and over twenty thousand hours that I've spent alone with predatory dogs. And uh, again, uh, the media uh, coverage on me supports my word. My integrity is 100%, and I only associate with uh, with um, rescues and so forth like that that I myself uh, feel have the same level of integrity. Uh, I will be announcing in the next couple of days a, a very well-known rescue organization in Los Angeles that I have cut ties with that have proven themselves to be uh, distrust. Uh, I can't whatsoever and it's an extreme disappointment because um, uh, I, I did a lot for them in regards to a, a particular dog and the treatment that they've given me has been as if I'm garbage so um, I'm upset I'm, I'm hurt I'm betrayed and uh, I know a lot of people who have gone through uh, friends that have betrayed you stab you in the back and so forth like that it happens I'm 100% human and uh, that hurts uh, a lot. And uh, what these people did, um, and they, they're self-protectionistic, uh, what they've done is horrible. And, um, you know, it's very sad. Uh, 
uh, if anybody knows uh, Zach Scow from Marley's Mutts, let, uh, I want him to put a shout out for Zach again. I, I know he's watching my episodes a few times. Uh, I just want to speak to Zach for being the kind of person who he has always been, a, a really committed, uh, integral person, a, a guy who's got great morals, great ethics. And uh, I've been fortunate to meet Zach a couple of times, and especially when he was up here a couple of years ago uh, for New Year's, he invited me out. Uh, him and his wife were here. They invited me out for dinner. Uh, sorry, for lunch uh, before I uh, brought him out to the airport. And uh, Zach is a guy who who's focused on saving lives, focused on saving dogs. So again, uh, Zach Scow, uh, if you know him, let him know uh, again that uh, I highly respect what he does. And he's the guy who kind of got me into doing vlogs. Over a year ago, uh, he tried to get to do it a couple years ago, sorry. And I, I kept chickening out, right? You know, the introvert, but um, I'm here and I'm doing it. So I do owe this vlog. Uh, the series itself and what I'm doing to Zach Scow, Marley's Mutts, uh, a man who is uh, who's a, who's human, and um, the example of uh, uh, just phenomenal man, phenomenal. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, want to talk about the next section here is your dog falling two steps backwards. Uh, that that next key point. A few people uh, had kind of commented on my uh, one of my uh, episodes regards to using the leash properly and unfortunately I tried to talk about it but I forgot to bring the leash with me so I've got this here this time and um, I'll talk about that in a little bit so uh, another of the comments on one of my uh, closed group postings was uh, regards to you know their dog uh, the, the, the person's dog uh, was advancing moving forward doing doing well and then suddenly their dog got really upset. It was Jennifer's post there in regards to her dog, I think, um, Pearl. Uh, was doing well at a coffee shop. And then 20 minutes out in, her dog completely went, uh, went uh, you know, off. And I had a, had a Rottweiler that come by. It doesn't matter what kind of dog it is. But um, Pearl had, her dog Pearl had gone after and started barking at the Rottweiler. And then was just livid after that. And uh, Jennifer... Uh, obviously quite concerned it's like you know it seems like we're going two steps forward and then two steps backwards which means we're back at the same place so i want to address that dogs aren't going two steps backwards uh, when they say things like dog is regressing uh, that is a uh, um an inexperienced term uh, that's an unskilled statement to make that the dog is regressing it's absolutely impossible for the dog to regress unless they've got a significant brain injury to do so the dog is cognitively present same thing like a human being we're not going to regress you know even the person who is an alcoholic and quote unquote falls off the wagon they do fall back they don't regress they just have been able to not succeed in those uh, 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 emotional or psychological threats to their existing environment and then they, they fall off the wagon and they start drinking again etc but they don't fall they don't regress it's part of their linear analog movement forward but at whatever happens is something has been impactful so strongly that they're not able to accommodate psychologically and or emotionally and then they start to uh, go back to what feels safe to that kind of behavior that kind of addiction but they don't regress because if they regress and they would just basically run away and, and throw everything away and uh, have significant psychological issues that would just essentially mirror what they were like before going through the aspects of, uh, of that. We all have our choices on whether or not we do stuff. It's not hard uh, to, to understand that. Uh, trying to get over addictions is an incredibly cruel and uh, desperate uh, thing sometimes. And um, unfortunately, it, it does claim um, a lot of victims. And of course, we've heard in the news about the opioids and um, the Sackler family and Johnson Johnson being uh, uh, being fined uh, eight billion dollars uh, in the news today, so it is a bit tough to see um, these pharmaceutical companies that are deliberately killing human beings, and um, you know there's not much of a stretch from from dogs as well. Your dog does not fall two steps backwards. Your dog does not fall back one step backwards. Your dog is reacting, your dog is behaving in a certain way, and they're fine, and they're great, and there's this level and all that cool, and they suddenly have this issue where they can't handle it, you know, 10, 15 minutes later, 20 minutes later, as, as uh, Jennifer said about Pearl. That's 20 long minutes that your dog survived doing nothing without freaking out, without trying to attack people, right? That, that's what you were saying before in your post. So for 20 minutes, 
uh, I'm trying, trying to keep this because I know this is my right hand actually. So I'm trying to keep this in, in and I don't know how to flip it. I'm sorry. I'm, you know, uh, but anyways, so that's 20 minutes that your dog, Pearl, has been stable and then she reacts. She doesn't fall backwards. She's got 20 incredible, solid, beautiful minutes of being stable, which means that her tolerance went from zero to one minute, to 10 minutes, to 20 minutes. That's freaking amazing progress. That's 20 minutes of progress. And then of course, it gets so much, it's so hard to handle sometimes. And then you went, oh my gosh, I gotta sit down. I can't handle this. So it's the same thing as if you're driving at 100, and, uh, 100 miles an hour, 120 miles an hour. That's like 200 kilometers an hour. If you drive like that for 10 minutes, it's pretty exhilarating, but it's also quite frightening because you're, you're paying attention to traffic that you're flying by. You're paying attention to scenery. You've got to assimilate the, uh, the, the, the terrain as it comes to you at 200 kilometers an hour, uh, 120 miles an hour. And you're trying to deal with that. And if you were to die for an hour, you'd be mentally exhausted unless you're a race car driver that's professional. You're going to be mentally exhausted. So Pearl lasting 20 minutes is pretty darn amazing, Jennifer. She's able to last 20 minutes and she's like, Argh! and then just something happens. So she got to 20 minutes. So maybe next time, you know, expose her to 18 minutes. Don't expect just because your dog has, uh, has progressed with my advice that it's going to be permanent. You've got to practice, 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 be consistent and be vigilant. But you also have to temper in whenever there is that potential issue, whenever there's possibly something that's going on, and then you want to go and say, okay, I better just take her out of it. Same thing when you see your child who's in a group of other kids and they're getting overwhelmed or they're starting to get wild out of the place. What do you say? You're like, okay, I better take my kid down before it has a, a total meltdown. And then, you know, and why do you take your kid out of the way so that they don't have a total meltdown? Because if you don't take care of that, your, your child is going to have a huge freak out. And then you got to deal with that taking him home as he's still freaking out and crying and getting upset and having a horrible day. And then, uh, you know, then he stays in his room for the rest of the day and doesn't want to come out or socialize anymore. So, again, recognizing that it is not two steps backwards. It is still two steps forward. It's just we fail as a human being. And I've done it myself. Even recently, we fail to recognize that sooner than later. And then we let our dog fall into that trigger. And as a parent, as our dog's parent, or dog's parents, I should have stopped it beforehand. So those are my fault, and those are things that I have to take responsibility. Because if your dog is recognized by the, the academics as a two to three year old uh, emotionally and cognitively uh, uh, sophisticated uh, uh, child, then your dog is going to need you to really keep some supervision on it and, and to recognize that I should take my dog away at 18 minutes instead of just letting him go because I think it's great. Accidents happen when we don't pay attention. And again, it's happened to me, so I'm not the, I'm not the person to say I, I'm you know above everybody else. Doesn't matter who, doesn't matter who or what kind of dogs I work with. Doesn't matter if my dogs that I work with are far past anybody else's uh, skill. Doesn't matter if these are vicious dogs, whatever. It's still my responsibility as the parent, as a guardian of my dog, that I make sure that they're not going to be way over what they don't need. And it's not the aspect of trigger stacking, it's not the aspect of flooding, it's the aspect of recognizing the tolerances that our dog has, recognizing the nuanced behavior of our dog, and then making things to do to address it. So, um, you know, again, uh, celebrate the fact that you got 20 incredibly beautiful minutes from Pearl, and then next time, you know, 18 minutes, and then you just kinda, kinda create tolerance further and further and so. Um, that's why when people, uh, when, when, when my colleagues say trigger stacking and etc and all that stuff, they're doing it themselves on training. They're just doing it really, really slow and they don't know what they're, you know, they don't realize that they're, they're essentially seeing the same thing. It's kind of funny the other day, I, I think I saw Upstate Canine Academy, uh, one of the, uh, the foolish people on there. Um, he was dealing with a a German Shepherd and the owner was there trying to get a muzzle on and this fool man I mean like he's a reasonable I mean he's got like 1.6 million views on this thing uh, because the dog's so reactive and all that stuff and uh, this fool has no idea what he's doing he's trying to throw a, a slip a slip leash over the dog and he gets a car on the muzzle and, he tr and then you know the dog's trying to attack him then the dog's trying to attack his human and then he uses like this is how disgusting this guy is he's using a catch pole 
on a reactive dog. A catch pole. Talk about cruelty. Disgusting, inexperienced individual like that. I saw that last night and I just... I, I got to talk about it and it doesn't matter if I only got two, you know, two or three hundred views on this, uh, on my, my blog, vlogs and all that stuff. But I got to talk about this because that is just pathetic. You don't, don't need to use a catch pole on a dog. If the, your, that dog has come into your facility and it's coming on, on with the owner's assistance. I have never used a catch pole, even if I had one, which I don't, I have never and would never use a catch pole. And the dogs that I deal with, they don't overtly react and don't rah, rah, rah. They wait and they stalk and they follow me throughout my home waiting for me. They've cornered me. Those are predatorial dogs. Those are the silent dogs. Those are the dogs that are extremely dangerous, 180 pounds, 700 PSI bite strength. Those are the dogs that even to use a catch pole on, that dog will then wait because of its exposure and that dog's uh, understanding of awe, the human's behavior with a catch pole and the abusive type of behavior, that will even be more distrustful. That, that, that fool is teaching that dog that anything that looks like a stick, that's what a catch pole is. It's a, it's a, it's a pole with, a, with a, um, a, a noose around it that they can pull through so that it goes around the dog's uh, throat. That fool of a trainer, Upstate Canine Academy in New York, is teaching that dog to be afraid of sticks, of brooms, of poles. Because the guy's too arrogant to understand that the abuse that he's causing at his own fear is what's causing it. He didn't even know how to approach it. He's, he doesn't have any idea how to approach the dog. He, he gets the, the, the the thing around the dog's muzzle halfway on and he starts reaching for it, trying to get at it. And of course the dog's like, Dude, you just tried to just lasso me with something that I have no idea what it is, and it's in my face, and now you're trying to pull it off of me? And then the owner does it as well, and it's like, oh my gosh. It's just, it, it's it's like a clown show. So, um, anyhow, getting back to this, because I, I just love to uh, to go on my little bit of a rail here. Uh, it seems that some of the people who, who are recognized as being uh, intelligent, great, top at the, at the thing, and they're just doing amateur L kindergarten uh, mistakes okay so uh, uh, two steps forward is what it is and what you should recognize too as well in regards to that 20 minutes that Pearl has been able to be accommodating with uh, with the environment uh, Jennifer is the fact that um, your dysfunctional dog um, your dysfunctional dog getting that point and then being reactive all that is is your dysfunctional dog has just hit a plateau that's all right so you got to recognize when things are going to happen you got to recognize those nuances and the behavior aspects and the way dog is blinking uh, how fast they're blinking what they're doing when they're licking their face as well their tail position um you know tail behavior uh, the way the dog is holding their paws as they're sa standing or sitting or laying down and how they're, they're like i think mike carson uh, you're probably watching here, um, you know, like I said to you about how Ghost was sitting in a certain way where she pretended that she was actually relaxed, but in actual fact, she was set, uh, laying down on the uh, on the floor of your home in a certain way where she had the ability to immediately jump up and attack. And, uh, you know, again, this is that thing of recognizing the nuanced behaviors of your dogs. I only deal with the dysfunctional dogs. I don't do the trick training obedience. Like I say, I'll refer people out to that. Um, but when it comes to the dysfunctional dogs itself, where we got to recognize those things and we got to recognize that when your dog's been able to be okay and then kind of goes up and, and gets upset, it's just a plateau. So we got to walk your dog back down. We got to down train your dog from that position and then slowly walk them up again. Just like the child that's afraid. You want to help them get back into the water again, right? You're not talking about getting to the swimming pool. So that's when your dysfunctional dog has hit a plateau. Let's recognize that. Uh, we do want to recognize positive progress. Super duper important. Super duper important. Even if your dog's been there for 20 minutes, Jennifer and, and Pearl freaks out and gets upset and all that, you still got to compliment her. You still have to, have to, have to compliment her. Because if you're able to pull back, which most times you can, doesn't even matter if you have a 150-pound dog, and I think Pearl's like 20 or 30 pounds, 
you had to recognize that she has still, when you pull her back, you've asked her not to get upset and you've been calm as calm as you can be physically because you're, you're going to be restraining. You still want to recognize your dog's compliance. You still want to recognize the fact that you asked your dog to come back, even though if you're struggling to pull her back, you recognize the fact that she did comply. Sorry, my, my computer fell off here, the uh, into screen shaver, saver. Um, you want to recognize your dog has indeed complied. And again, it's the same thing as, you know, the parent with the little kid, right? And the kid, you know, two-year-old kids drawing like scratch marks on their on their paper. And then they bring the paper to you and go, mommy, look. And you know it's you're just going to throw it in the garbage because you've got 700 pieces of those things already. The first couple of 20 or 30 are, are the ones that you save. But the next 300, unless, unless you're a Van Gogh, <laughs> you're not going to keep. But you still got to acknowledge them. Just like uh, uh, Lo Lois and Stewie in Family Guy. Mom, 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 mom. And then it's like, yes, Stewie. So the same thing on that end is you got to recognize positive progress. So when you do correct your dog, good job, good job, good job. And you want to be firm. You don't want to be repetitive because if you're repetitive, then your dog doesn't hear it anymore. And that comes to the aspect of barking and communication, which becomes redundant and nagging and so forth like that, then your dog then becomes dismissive in regards to that because it essentially becomes redundant, right? It's a redundant aspect of, your, of another dog barking, etc. That's why when you see dogs barking, they're just kind of ignoring it. When it comes to the predatorial and just dis highly dysfunctional dogs, it's a different matter. And if you watch my cover photo at the top of my rescue page, R Far Bark Bark Rescue on Facebook, you'll see where the red, the German Shepherd, He's interacting with uh, both Walter, the Harlequin, and Lincoln, the Fawn. Both of those dogs, one is deemed dangerous uh, for dog reactivity, etc. The other one is deemed extremely dangerous for significant attacks on 16 people, including dragging a shelter worker into his kennel, etc. But you'll see Red, the German Shepherd, uh, he is barking at Walter uh, in the video a couple of times. And you can see Walter's reaction. Watch that. It's gorgeous how Walter... Walter reasons and controls himself instead of attacking the dog. And Walter is towering over Red uh, uh, probably about 23 inches. Uh, he's quite much taller than the German Shepherd. Uh, and Red actually belongs to a well-known, um, uh, the son of a well-known criminal lawyer here in British Columbia. So again, I've mentioned that before, so I'm quite uh, honored to have been asked by him last year to work with his, uh, with his dog after he'd gone through four three, four different trainers. All treat trainers wasn't able to get a movement forward. The only problem is the consistency and he's quite busy. So unfortunately, um, I don't know what's going on with him. But again, uh, you see the way that how uh, Walter just tolerates his bargain, but it's, it's acknowledged versus it's a type of barking which has no bearing on it whatsoever. So the dog does understand the tone, the, the way it, it is done, that aspect of communication like I said uh, in my past episodes, if we listen, we can hear our dog, quote unquote, talking. Just like the whale siren, the sounds from the whales, same thing, we can do that with our dogs. So uh, again, um, you want to watch the way your dog is behaving, how the progress is, is occurring. You always want to praise your dog. After you have asked them to do something, you bring them back, you praise them, you reset them like I've taught uh, my clients how to reset their dog, particularly on their dog's behavior. You want to touch your dog on the specific area of their body their joy spot that they enjoy that they like and we'll get to that because i'm going to go a little bit on ticklish aspect and i want to make sure i get this under uh, under an hour and 15 minutes today on this broadcast because uh like i say, it takes me about three hours afterwards to go over this and then write everything down and uh today i actually ended up thinking i double booked and so forth i ended up just screwing up two people's uh appointments um with the same name and um, that was bad. And so I, I got to pay my bills. But unfortunately, this is kind of screwed up. So I, I'm just kind of getting limited on how much time I can spend here on, on my vlogs. Uh, again, if you guys can please share my vlog. Please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Please like my Facebook page. Please share my Facebook. Uh, with There are actually people who I've helped in my closed group who aren't even following my, my, my rescue page. And it, and it says specifically, if I'm going to help you, please make sure you're following my rescue page, my Instagram, my, my YouTube and all that stuff. So even though I know that, I'm still going to help these people. And I hope and that they would follow through. And uh, I do ask uh, that to happen. So again, um, yeah, okay. So um, 
Resetting your dog, I've talked about that. We're going to bring him back in compliance-wise. You're going to touch your dog's joy spot. You're, uh, um, and then you're going to, um, you know, let's your dog in a calm, firm tone. For those of you who have worked with me, you understand what I'm talking about, using your dog's voice key. And then uh, one of the most important things that anybody can do, it doesn't matter if you've been a client or not, or you're just watching my vlog and sharing this, always talk normal to your dog for at least seven seconds. Just a regular tone of voice. Doesn't matter if you, they, they try to attack somebody or they've done this great trick that you're like, ah, I'm so happy. You bring them back to you when you talk to them. Like I talked about the other day about dominant uh, leash control. So you bring them back to you in that aspect of it. And you say in a very calm, regular conversational tone and praise your dog in a regular conversational tone. So it's sincere. It's genuine. It's not disingenuous. It is loving, sincere firm not high pitched etc etc and you want to that is also the perfect time to establish the voice key with your dog as well to reinforce that voice key with your dog but again just talk normal for about seven seconds because what happens if you're talking excitedly or in a strange or stressed type of voice your dog is going to keep picking up on that and if your dog's a dysfunctional dog skittish reactive dangerous dog and you're talking in a higher pitch or tone and frequency and intonation cadence rhythm grammatical error uh, grammatical uh, uh, structure etc it's going to keep your dog amped up it's going to keep your dog up at that excited level or that aggressive level and your dog's not going to be able to reset themselves which is that self-regulation that dogs can do that's why a dog doesn't attack. That's why Walter didn't attack Red in the video because it's self-regulation. That's your dog thinking. That's your dog reasoning. That's your dog's intelligence. And that's the intelligence that dogs have that the academia, that the behaviors and uh, you know scientists don't believe that dogs have. But they will in the next 10, 20, 30 decades, uh, who knows when it's going to happen. But they will realize that because the same thing like Jane Goodall said about her primate subjects instead of giving them numbers she gave them names and all the scientists out there attacked her and said she was an idiot she was this dumb blonde girl they said some of the rudest things to her and now of course she is and look at all these other critics so that's why um, we want to recognize there's the emotional context and the emotional context of primates that Jane Goodall has proven same with dolphins and with other scientists and all that uh, there is the emotional context and it's kind of funny but well not funny it's banal uh, inane the fact that we talk about emotional context with primates, with dolphins, with pigs, but not with dogs. Why? Why are we not recognizing dogs as sentient beings? Why are we not recognizing the emotional functionality of a dog? Just like we have an emotional functionality. And that's the aspect that, uh, you know, why I ask people to share my stuff. Uh, so that way we can share and really waking up the world to the consciousness of that. Because when your dog dies, you feel it inside of here emotionally. You don't you don't feel that if you drop your cell phone. You feel upset, of course, but you don't feel emotionally upset and hurt and lost when your dog dies inside, right? That's what you feel, I mean. So that's what you feel inside, and that's that feeling. So why are we not correlating? Why are not scientists pushing that into reality as a regular constant aspect of the dog, which is a psychological aspect, which is the cohabitation answer, which is the emotional isomorphism. And again, uh, you know, as, as we as I progress, as you guys follow me on my journey here, I progress weeks down below, we're going to start talking about things more on that psychological level and how I have a, a, a post it, a post it uh, or a pin in regards to uh, how consciousness was created through the aspect of logic and, and non-logic default situations and so forth like that. And then we create that whole predication on, on consciousness and behavior as well. Um, but that's something else again. Um, okay, so uh, reset your dog. Spend seven seconds with them. And here's the thing is a lot of times I t say to my clients, okay, you know, spend three seconds with your dog. Spend one second with your dog and just hold them. Don't move your hand. And I'll go like this. I say, okay, okay spend seven seconds. They're like, I'm like, no, no, no. Spend seven seconds. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004. 1,005, 1,006, 1,007. Try that. It feels uncomfortable for us to be able to connect like that to our dogs because we don't have the emotional sophistication 
or allowances or permissions to ourselves to feel emotionally connected to our dog. You would never hold your wife's hand and go like this, Oh, you're such a good honey baby. I love you. You're so nice. She'll slap you in the face. You will always remember the sunset that lasts for 20 minutes in silence with the man you love. Then you will remember the hour drive it took to get through all that traffic. Okay, so... Uh, you know, when you're driving your car, blah, 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 beep, beep, beep. I know, I, I'm trying to do references and all that stuff without being too much. So, uh, seven seconds, you guys try it, you'll find it works. And you'll find your dog's going to be like, what? In the beginning, <laughs> they're all over the place. And then eventually, you're going to find that your dog is going to settle down sooner and faster. And a lot of times in that situation, it's when I give my dog a hug and I say, give me a hug. And that reinforces it and, I, and it works all the time. If your dog is a brat at the uh, dog park or in the backyard with the other dogs, reset with them. Give them a hug, setting, uh, spending seven seconds with them, etc. Uh, and then the other part, which is an add-on, so I got to kind of wrap my head around here because I haven't had a chance to. But uh, the add-on is use your dog's name only. Don't give, don't talk to your dog in the nickname. You know, if your dog's name is, uh, oh, I was gonna say someone's name here, and then he would have went, what, what, what? Um, and they're really nice and quiet today. <laughs> um, uh, 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 I, I, I can't, okay, yeah, use your dog's name like Carlson. So if your dog's name is Carlson, you use Carlson as your dog's name, right? You're not going to go Carly or Carl or, or whatever. When you're resetting with your dog, when you're spending seven seconds with them, you just say their name, good boy Carlson, good boy Carlson. You don't say good boy, silly boy, none of that other stuff that I talk about when we're dealing with the down training of the dog's dysfunctions. You're always going to say good boy, Carlson. Carlson, you're a good boy. You're okay, Carlson. You'll use your dog's name. Same thing like when someone uses your name with respect. Good boy, Carlson. You're going to do that. You're going to reset your dog with that. The other part of that is don't go calling your dog swear words. Okay, guys? There's a lot of you guys out there that do that. I see it in posts. People are like, uh, you know, and like I said, I don't swear. So, you know, a lot of people say, you know, my, my you know, my crap head, my, my dung heap of a dog, my stupid dog, uh, my, you know, and a lot of the trainers and behaviors do that when they're talking about that dog's so stupid, it doesn't pay attention, it won't take the treat anymore, whatever. So you devalue your dog right away. We don't say that to our loved ones. You don't go over to your wife or husband and say, you're a stupid bitch. You would never say that. You would never get on the phone and say, my husband is a total dickhead. Well, okay, some of you, but like, I'm mean, talking about in just regular conversation, you know? Like, uh, you know, oh, my husband did the really nice thing. He brought me some flowers today. He's the best dickhead in the world. You would never say that. And I know it's kind of making a joke about it because I'm just not comfortable with swearing. I mean, unless you're really warranted, swearing is such an uncouth uh emotionally uh, unstable statement because for for someone thank you uh, for someone to say that you know to swear it's uncouth how many times have you had an argument with somebody especially online right you know because the internet rule of causing a fight online is <laughs> is you know post a comment and then the second one is wait so if you're having an argument online with somebody and they're getting pissed off because you know you're winning they start swearing at you I think there's a, this uh, one of my trolls, uh, Jackie Porteous, 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 or whatever her name is, and Sheila Beck. They start swearing at me, and they start, you know, I'm like, you guys just lost right off the bat. You can't counter my argument, so you start swearing. It's an emotional uh, lack of sophistication. You see these little articles that say, oh, you know, intelligent people swear, and that's it. No, they don't. Intelligent people don't swear during regular conversation, so don't swear at your dog. And saying stuff like that, unless it's warranted, right? There's nothing wrong with being upset and going, oh, you effing da 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 da, right? When you're, if you're upset, they crapped on the floor, they, they attacked each other, right? One dog attacks the other, which we'll get to later on. Segue. Uh, we just don't want that to happen. We want to use regular language because if you're using their name, you're showing your dog respect. If you start referring to them as the dog or as my little, uh, you know, whatever uh, jerk dog, what ends up happening is mentally you start thinking of that. Mentally, you devalue your dog right off the bat. You don't think your dog is of any value because you're no longer using their name. You're not pronouncing them. You're not individualizing them. 
you are emotionally disenfranchising from your dog. And that's why I say to people, my clients, when I, when I tell them how to, how I know that. So you're not connected to your dog, but you're not respecting your dog. If someone referred to us as, as, as oh, I'm just going to swear for, oh, I hate this. Okay, you guys, I hate you guys now. Uh, okay, so I'm never going to, you know, if someone goes, yeah, James, he's, he's a shithead. He's a shithead. He's a shithead. And then I go, well, I see the guy, hey, how's it going? He goes, hey, shithead. I'm going to say to him, you know, my name's James. It's not cool. I don't appreciate you swearing at me. And I especially don't appreciate you calling me a shithead. That's, that's disrespectful. You can't have a relationship with two people if one person is always calling you names. You won't be together with that person. This is the same with your dog. Your dog understands tones. And not only that, your dog doesn't have a, a level of respect within your family, within your, your, your perception anymore. You don't have connection with your dog. So don't swear. Don't call your dog stupid. Don't refer to him when you're talking to people about that because you wouldn't do that about your child. You wouldn't do that about your, 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 your wife or husband or boyfriend or girlfriend. You would never, ever all the names during regular conversation. Hey, you know, if you caught your wife or your, your girlfriend cheating on you, I mean, who hasn't had that happen, right? You, you're going to be like, yeah, that blah, blah, blah. You're going to be really upset because of the betrayal and all that stuff. But you would never do that during regular conversation. You, you, don't post publicly what kind of loser your dog is. Because when I read stuff like that, I'm like, I don't know if I want to help these people. But then again, I'm obligated to help because it's their dog that's the victim. But you don't want that to happen. So stop using these different names. Use your dog's name. It'll make you feel better too. And it'll connect you better on, on that aspect of it. Uh, yesterday I talked about uh, uh, um, you know, about dogs getting their paws clipped and, and so forth like that. Um, you know, I'll go on and deal with that later on because it's ticklish and reactive and hypersensitivity. Just regards to why does your dog get kind of like antsy or be reactive, etc. You clip their nails and so forth with the Dremel, the grinder, or just a regular nail clipper and all that stuff. And um, I'll, I'll, I'll reserve that for another time. Let me just kind of clear this off here then. Um, okay, so... Um, because it's just that part when it comes to a dysfunctional dog, that kind of reactivity and hypersensitivity, uh, they can get quite dangerous uh, on my end because to them, they think it's an attack. Uh, you no, know, what you want to do too is when you're with your dog and you're petting them, just slow down when you pet them. Don't don't pet them super fast because dogs are processing at one tenth of a second, so they're hypersensitive. And of course, you can imagine that if they're amped up and you're petting them like this, right, it doesn't work. Again, seven seconds, etc. You want to have calmness in the beginning so your dog has a standard, has a foundation, has a keel, has a safe zone to, to trust that you're not going to be all hyped up and it allows your dog to bring themselves down, to reset themselves so that when they do come to you from an animated situation, they're going to be reset and all that. So, um, you know, when it comes to just figuring out where to touch your dog, just make sure you're not touching your dog in those places where he's hypersensitive or unfamiliar with, which is, again, like I said the other day about dogs humping other dogs, how to desensitize them in regards to, to um, addressing the back end on that. Go check the article, uh, blog on it, and you'll, you'll see what I mean, and it makes perfect sense. And my dogs have had other dogs try to hump them, and my dogs, like I said, including the ones that I um, have been hired to help, uh, some of these uh, dogs will tear the other dog apart. It doesn't matter if they're smaller than, than the other dog doing it. They're just, they, they will go right to the mat. Uh, another thing I, I saw on a post the other day, and this is a post that happens quite often. A lot of people say, I feed my dog every day, and then suddenly my dog doesn't want to eat anymore. Or in the mornings, my dog won't eat. Or at night, my dog won't eat, but they'll eat the rest of the day or they'll, they'll whatever. Why does your dog decide not to eat today? And it's frustrating, isn't it? It's crazy. Your dog has been eating this. Uh, no problem. They've been, you give them... Uh, Two cups, one, and, you know, with the dogs here, the Danes, they, when I was feeding kibble in the way, way in the beginning, I was giving them uh, eight to ten cups a day. And they were pooping out six to eight cups uh, in feces. <laughs> but here's the thing is, 
you're giving your dog exactly the same thing over and 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 over again. Sounded a little boring, didn't it, right? Repetitive, what I said. Over and over and over and over. Nagging, right? Over and over again. You're giving your dog kibble. The same thing over and over again. It's like eating cereal every day without milk. And some of you might like Kellogg's Corn Flakes, so my apologies ahead of time. But if you're eating cereal, Kellogg's Corn Flakes, every single day without milk, you're going to start punching yourself in the face. Your dog has taste. That's why your dog can figure out, I want this treat versus this treat. And this is a scent-driven aspect why some dogs are able to understand, right? Because, you know, uh, I could go on that one in regards to the, um, how dogs have the different ability to cognitively process what their scent-driven uh, treats that they want, etc. And maybe I'll, I'll deal with that in another time, which is a great way that allows you to understand why your dog is in analytical in regards to the processing of uh, uh, treat value. Um, but if you're giving your dog exactly the same thing every single day, your dog is going to go crazy, ape crap. Your dog is going to go off the wall and he's not going to want to eat anymore or she's not going to want to graze anymore because you're giving them cereal, dry cereal, the same thing over and over again. You know, have you, you know, like those fizz busters, you put them in your mouth and they start tingling and all that or you, you suck on those uh, little mints that start sucking all the moisture from your tongue. And you know how you start getting the little bump ridges on your tongue? Like if we did that when we were kids, we'd suck on the Lifesaver for an hour and then we'd have like this huge ring on our tongue. Imagine that even the kibble, and it's always dry. Always, always dry. How their mouth is feeling. And it's the same taste, because they, they, they have such incredible ability to process taste. And it's the same thing over and over again. So you can switch it up. You know, again, there's nothing wrong with giving a little bit of your human food on it, kind of mixing it in once in a while. If you have some broth from your meals, it's okay to kind of mix it in every once in a while, surprise them or whatever. You know, share a little bit of what you eat with them That's as long as it's safe. Make sure there's no uh, 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 toxic, uh, you know, sugars like xylitol in them, etc. Um, you want to make sure that it's safe food. Do not give your dog grapes or raisins that's toxic. They'll die. Don't give them seeds from apples. Don't give them the green stems because it has trace amounts of cyanide. All the stuff, I don't know. I just Googled it before and learned it, so I don't know these things. Things I'm not smart when it comes to stuff like that. Way more smarter people than me. Uh, like I say, there's way better trainers that trick agility, all that stuff. I know where my place is. But again, um, just make sure that whatever you feed your dog is human. Uh, that's human food is safe for your dog to eat. Even, uh, you know, just, just make sure. But again, kind of keep a little bit of the stuff with you. Uh, share it with your dog every once in a while. Maybe mix it in with the food uh, at night. And then in the morning, you can sprinkle it all in and mix it all up. Uh, you know, uh, salmon, canned salmon every once in a while. Go to the dollar store, hey, and, you know, buy a can of oysters. And just, if you like the oysters, then just dribble the, the, the cottonseed oil that's in those oysters on their thing. Every once in a while, a little bit of a surprise. It doesn't cost anything. You don't drink the oil anyway. So you kind of you kind of recycle, right? You kind of share uh, a can of a dollar, 25 cent can of oysters, uh, the juice, and they're going to go happy. And they'll be like, oh my gosh, my human loves me today. I'm not eating cornflakes. So um, do that again, right? So put that into scale. Sometimes your dog will end up not wanting to eat anything, and they're just getting bored. And a lot of times if your dog doesn't want to eat after it gets to that point, then it's a psychological aspect of it, and it, it points to an aspect um, it depends on what type of functioning level it is that they are, but it's going to be an emotional context that your dog is going to be suffering some issues from with that dysfunction becomes a little bit more. Your dog no longer wants to eat anything, even though you give them all the stuff that they normally would eat, or it could be a medical issue as well. Um, and so you want to kind of keep an eye on that. Um, okay. So, um, let me just see. Oh, shoot. Okay. Uh, I'm going a little bit over time here, so I won't be able to get to uh, these other three topics in regards to introducing a new dysfunctional dog into your existing family of dogs, uh, the importance of preventing immediate dog on dog attacks, or watching for and watching for opportunistic or predatory nuances. Um, those things uh, we'll get to at another time as well. And those are really significant issues to deal with if you have a dysfunctional dog, if you already have a couple of dogs at home, one or, or more dogs at, at home, and um, you want to be able to excuse me, watch out for things where the dog coming in or the existing dogs in your home 
look for opportunities to attack and um, how to prevent that, which is uh, relatively quite straightforward if you're paying attention. I have failed myself where I haven't paid attention and they've gotten to fight. So like I said, I'm not perfect and I'm just trying to share what I've learned and why I've got 100% success on things. Uh, so I'm going to go on to some members' questions. I'm not going to be able to get to all of them, obviously. Uh, but I'll, I'll get some. These are some questions that are either on my um, uh, Facebook page or they're going to be ones that are in my closed group. And, and uh, again, I will answer the people in my closed group uh, their questions before I answer the public page, which means that if you want to find out or you want to ask me a question about your own dog training, like Sarah has back east in Toronto, um, come to my closed group. You can join, anyone can join, just say you, you watch my vlog, whatever it is, and then you'll be accepted in, and then you can post a question there, and you'll get free uh, free uh, uh, down training for sure. Hi, Brandy, I will need definitely need to watch when you discuss it, yeah. You know, I, I love the fact how great you are, Brandy, right? I mean, you had posted in um, Peace, Love, Danes, I think it was, and then I read your dog's, uh, just from what you described, I read your dog's psychological personality and his, pers his profile, and you're like, how did you even know, right? And it's, again, just the same thing like when we know our loved ones we can connect to our loved ones and we can finish their sentences I fall in love with your dog which means that he your dog's coming over to my place now and you don't have a dog anymore haha <laughs> no more dating for brandy um but i have to fall in love with every single dog i do I, I really do and i do it in a visceral a humanistic way in the sense that it's just i feel the same emotional context it's not higher than you do for your dog when i first see read or meet them because to save their life is very very important to me um, okay so uh, uh the first question i'm going to get to for sure uh mike carson uh mike carson um, uh, he was uh the other day was uh, went and met with him and his wife colleen with his dogs uh, uh, uh great pyrenees uh mixes two of them ghost and olive and so uh, mike is also uh, he owns the pet boutique in north vancouver I believe I don't know if it's the same Mike Carson. I'm hoping it's the same one. Uh, so he says, uh, "This is due to the leash that we talked about the other day." Uh, I have a question regarding the proper order to correct your dog. Is it a quick pull on the leash followed by pulling them back to you for verbal reassurance and a hug, or do you let them continue to bark and lunge for a minute before pulling them back to you? So uh, initially, uh, when it comes to, for example, your dog barking out the window, I always let the dog bark right our my dogs bark they bark 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 and uh, if you see that uh that episode about dogs barking at the window you see i've included a link uh for how to stop your dog from barking fireworks which you can see i've got um five or six dogs uh uh yeah no five dogs what is it? No. Uh, six dogs and five of them are all dog reactive sound reactive reactive dangerous dogs and you'll see in that uh, link in uh, again the one about dogs barking out the window I've got them all calm while fireworks are literally sounding like they're next door they're so freaking loud and I'm able to calm them all down so um, that is where you have to let those dogs bark right let them off here barking at the window etc so when it comes to this part on the leash you can not do it don't let them get to that point because outside you want them to stop right away because otherwise if you keep doing it then it's even more work and more work and more work so you want to address it and the thing is it seems like okay well why am I addressing when they're not really barking as we're approaching because you want to address the fact because your dog already registers that the other dog or he, oh I was going to say other dog instead of human the other dog is already approaching your uh, you know if it's even 200 meters away that other dog is already a, a threat to your dog and so they're even though they're not rah, 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 they're already getting their like uh -oh, uh -oh, anticipatory aspects of uh, reactionary behavior uh, same thing like um, mm, I'll get into the thing about semi-trailer semi-truck trailer coming to you know I'll talk about it some other time to put scale or context into that but you want to address them immediately if not you want to address them even before quote unquote immediately in your mind because in your dog's mind they're already getting ready to go up they're already 60 70 80 percent boiling up they're getting ready to, to get really upset and freak out and go 100% at the other dog. And so you want to correct them, you want to address that. And when it comes to the leash part, if they do go run the leash and you're not able to catch them in time, and that, like I said, if you're paying attention, and you're, you're, you're uh, what I call it, being your dog's bodyguard, you have your leash ninja skills going on, you want to make sure that you're correcting them, you want to have your left hand 
and if right-handed you want to have your left left hand on it ready to pull and you have to pull you pull them both at the same time or you pull them in like that so you let your dog go out if your dog runs out to the end of the line they run out to the end of the line there's nothing you can do and you're going to give them a quick snap and relax that's it and then your dog will go off again and you give them a snap a little bit of thing and your dog will run out again and this will happen in you know in in three, four tenths of a second, boom, and then your dog's like, rah, 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 right? And so, and sometimes, you know, us Dane owners, our, our big large dog owners, is very exhausting. I mean, uh, you know, that's why I have some muscles. So again, you want to be able to just do a quick thing, pull back, and then your dog go back, go, pull back, and so forth like that. If it comes to a point where they're just going on and going on and relentless because they know they can use their weight, even a 50 pound, 30 pound dog will use their weight against somebody who's not uh, physically strong, then if it comes to the point, then you do have to physically bring them in evenly with an even amount of energy, firmly bring them in so you're not bringing them haphazardly, like jerkingly back because then your dog is feeling like he can, he's he's feeling like, oh, okay, so I do have a little bit of slack. Oh, I do, I can keep going forward and going forward. But if you bring them back smooth, then your dog understands that you bring them back smoothly. You're not doing a tug of war with them. And then when you do bring them back, then you go and reset with them if you can. Uh, be careful with people with dysfunctional dogs that are reactive because there are those dogs which, uh, again, are, are extremely dangerous or, or not familiar with being touched, predatorial dogs, that you do try to give them a hug. While they're elevated, they will turn and they will bite you and they may either nip you or they may uh, misinterpret your behavior as, uh, as confrontational and then they will go to attack you. And when they attack you, you're pretty well screwed because you're then stuck to them with a the leash. And I've had that happen. I've had it where I've had uh, I've had one of my uh, Danes um, um, uh, when I, I walk with a, at night with a, a couple of LED lights on me that are super bright. And because people in my neighborhood are such jerks, but so they're super bright. And there's been times where they don't recognize me because of the light shining. A lot of stuff aspect in regards to how the dogs process the field of vision, etc. But uh, long story short, they've come after me, and I'm like, holy crap! And they're on, and I have them on leash. I have them on retractable, thank goodness. But they're on leash with uh, with that, and it's like, oh my gosh! And I can't let go of them, and they're just gonna run away if I do that, or it'll be hard to find them in the dark. So I'm like, oh my gosh! And I'm stuck in this situation where I have to deal with it. So you know, I won't go and try to give them a hug, but I will. Try Try to bring them back or alert them if that's the case. And um, so when it comes, Mike, uh, hopefully I'm answering your question properly as I just go off of my organic wildness. Uh, just bring them back. That's it. And if you have to pull them right back, and when you do pull them back for verbal assurance, you just give them that calm, nice talking to, and then they're pretty cool, pretty happy. Who's out there watching me? Can, can anybody say hi? Anyone say hi? Sometimes I feel lonely because I don't even know who's watching me anymore. And sometimes I feel like there's nobody watching and I'm just going to talk to myself again. Uh, hello, everybody. So, um, uh, so I hope that answers your question in regards to um, uh, them barking on a leash and so forth like that. Uh, if you have uh, questions about it further, go ahead and ask. Right, ask, uh, put it in the comments. Like I say, I'll read them. I can't answer them, and I won't be answering because again, I just feel weird answering stuff that is at live and then after when people are watching this recorded. So, so there's that. Uh, then I'm going to get to the second one because I'm way over now. Uh, the second one, and then we'll have to answer the other ones later on. Uh, Chantel writes, and I put the link in there from where she originally asked a question. Chantel says, uh, Morning, James. Uh, and this is probably a couple of nights ago, I'm sorry, or a couple of days ago. Is it possible to work on training with more than one dog at a time? I have three, only one is reactive. Should it always be done one on one? So that kind of goes back to somewhat. Uh, thanks, Mike. Um, so it's kind of going, I hope that answered some of it. And again, if you want more definition of it, ask another question so then we can whittle it down to specifically what you want to know uh chantel uh so she again wants to know is it possible to work with more than one dog at a time i have three only one is reactive should it always be done one-on-one -on -one? in the beginning you want to spend some time with them and you want to do one-on-one -on -one for nothing other than quality time you don't want to go out, you know, you start dating somebody for the first time. You don't want to go out and meet 200 of their friends all at once. Hi, Mary. Uh, you don't want to meet 200 of their friends all, right? You just want to kind of spend one-on-one -on -one time, you know, have your little honeymoon period and spend time and hang out with them. And so you want to bond with that person. Same thing with your dog. Your dog is reactive, especially, and they don't have trust issues or they do have trust issues, whatever it is. 
spend some time with them one-on-one. -on -one. So that way you also get to know the personality and how they walk on lead, what their behaviors are, what they sniff, what they stop to pee, what they stop to smell at, um, and all that. Oh, I should say one thing Irene Sh Chambers had said to me, which uh, is uh, she has a, a couple of dogs, uh, her and her husband, George and Irene. Uh, they gave me some incredibly great advice, and that was don't let your dog eat people's grass. Why? Because pesticides. We don't know what's in the grass when our dogs are going, oh, it's a beautiful lawn. Your dog starts, um, 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 uh. could be pesticides in the grass. Uh, there's been a rash of just mentally delusional, unstable people out there are poisoning dogs, right? You see the ones where morons are putting nails in, in meat and, and rat poison in, in meat, uh, throwing poison everywhere. These freaking uh, morons. Uh, so be careful. And so they said to me, you know, they have to be careful because that's what was happening just at the, 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 the lake that was just a few hundred, uh, um, oh, not a few, a couple of uh, miles away. Anyways, whatever. Uh, they also said they don't let their dog stop, either of their dogs stop to eat grass on people's lawn. Even if they know them, they're not going to. And especially if the lawn is a nice looking lawn, always indicates fertilizer which means pesticides etc etc so it's a great thing don't let them stop but again you want to walk with your dog getting back to that right you want to walk with your dog on a regular basis in the beginning just so you get that connection you get to see their behavior their nuances right because every dog is different just like us we can't say every dog is the same they're always different that's why in the beginning i said always make sure that your trainer behaviors or if you are a trainer or behaviors Ask for photos, ask for a detailed description, concise description of your dog or their dog's behavior. Then it shows that you want to have a, an actual connection and you want to know the details. Same thing when you go for a walk with them, uh, Chantel. You want to be able to go and understand how your dog's behavior on leash. The connection, the way you talk to them to see what your dog is reacting. You're not concentrating on all the other dogs. And then when you get to the point where you are somewhat comfortable or comfortable or proficient, then you can start working with your dog with other dogs in your in your family right your other dogs in your group uh, i say group i'd rather use group than pack because pack is so asinine uh familial right family but again uh the other dogs in your group then you just walk with them then you start to learn because then oh you know what's going on with this one new dog and the other two or three or whatever then you can be okay with that like i have done so where i would walk nero who was reactive great dane and then walter who's reactive great dane then sammy who's in her little wheelchair and she's 30 pounds all on retractables and i had to pay attention to what was going on um so you know it's happened where i've dropped the retractable as people have dropped their own leashes like that it happens to everybody in the world when people complain about stuff you know what to say dude just shut up all right just tell them to shut up because nobody is perfect and when we start expecting other people to follow to our standard then we're just not cool anymore because we think we're better than other people and the world should not be this way yada yada all right so me and my soapbox right you, you guys never lose that soapbox for me um so you know, when you do go out with uh, two or three dogs there's chantelle uh and one is reactive uh the initial amount of time with them training and be uh, and working with them then they start to understand your behavior you start to understand their behavior their nuances personality when you go the other dog or dogs uh, for the walk two to three dogs at that time then you're okay to be able to do that right you know I always see this uh, the parts where you see the dog walkers walking with five six seven eight dogs and again all those dog walkers they start with your dog when they adding them onto their group they start with that your dog by themselves same logic Get to know the dog, get to work commands, etc. Reciprocal aspects of leash control, leash ninja. Uh, you work on that and the dog does understand the, the connection. And then when you do have them in the group walking, you're able to use the same consistency of command, the same consistency of voice, the same consistency of communication because you've established it with the other two dogs. And then the new dog understands the same thing is consistent and they see the behavior. They don't mimic. They just follow along as part of a team, as part of a group. That's why I say it's not like the dog is mimicking, which is what shows you how uh, immature and inexperienced these uh, academics are when they're saying about the mimicking. It's not mimicking. They're just following how the behavior of the group has been established. Same thing like you working in an office. And if you have an office, say 20 people in it, and I used to work corporate myself. So you have an office with 20 people in it. Everyone's going to have different personalities. Everyone's going to have different cliques and all that. And then the manager, the floor manager, the supervisor, 
director, the whatever, general manager will come down and he will manage or she will manage, actually she will manage everybody in the office accordingly, knowing that this particular group and this particular person and that particular uh, person have unique personalities. So how do we manage? Put them together as a puzzle piece together. And nobody in the office is mimicking the other person, are they? If we don't respect the way dogs behave and we use such uh, anecdotal and superficial terms such as mimicking and sectra and not using our dog's name, we devalue the dog, we see the dog as property, and that's why six million dogs are killed annually. This is my rant because I'm going to keep fighting for the safety and the love and the lives of dogs because if we know what we're talking about and we're not on our dogs and are recognizing the sentience of dogs, then that means that instead of six million dogs being killed, maybe five and a half million. And then the next year, maybe five million. And then eventually one day we'll get to a point where people won't be buying from backyard breeders that are using the money for drugs, that we'll be having dogs that are viscerally and emotionally connected and so we always want to have communication with our dogs same thing again um you know all the stuff goes round and round i'm going to keep going on that but uh you know anyway so i hope that answered your question chantel uh all right so uh, i've gone probably an hour 20 hour 30 minutes i'm guessing i'm surprised my battery lasted if you have any questions please let me know please share my work please share it on your facebook please share it uh you know please subscribe to my youtube channel I mean, um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to teach everybody what I've learned that it's taken me over 20,000 hours to amass um, in some very extremely in, intense times. Uh, a lot of you people, uh, especially my clients, will know and can attest 100% that my work is 100% accurate with every single type of dog. Uh, oh, actually, my 15% battery thing is now on. Okay, woohoo! So that's my sign. Wow. Um, yeah, so uh, all my work is 100%. I've never turned down any dog, and I will accept any dog. And I've said this openly to everybody, my trolls, every single person, people somewhat near at the top of the food chain, Dr. Rebecca Ledger, who's here in Vancouver, who has uh, tacitly attacked me as well in her newspaper. I have said I will take any dog, and I've taken dogs that she has declared to be killed, and I've been able to help uh, save them. So, because every single dog can be helped when we're not trying to, had our bank accounts or buy our Gucci high heels. So this is the reason uh, why we can make this change. Uh, if we can find uh, compassion for each other, make this world that we live in a much better place. Uh, you know, the beautiful part about these videos and why I'm trying to do them every single day is that this is my legacy. There's not going to be a book out that I'm going to make. There's not going to be a TV series about me. There's not going to be a movie about me or anything like that. But I do trust that my work will survive after my death in 20, 30, 40, 50 years from now. Um, and that the society will see this and learn from it, uh, what I've done. Uh, and I do hope, I pray to God, that there will be people much better than me. That there will be people who are much more proficient. That there will be people who understand how to work with dogs. That they will prove me wrong. That I'm alone right now. And this is the pain that I feel as I continue to work on this. This is the pain that I feel... All these dogs are being killed, and we're having these trainers and behaviors who are inexperienced, who are just summarily killing dogs, declaring them unfixable or broken, or they can't be changed with treats and medication. We're in the canine species. Does food exist as a communication tool? This is an anthropomorphization of human arrogance, of our conjecture that dogs must comply to food. It's disgusting how arrogant our species has become. We are a technologically driven species. And we have forgotten our souls. Whether or not you believe in God does not matter to me. I ask that you believe in the life of your dog. In the soul of a dog. And, um, you know, you look on my website. I talk about the soul of a dog. And this can happen. And uh, this digital memory of what I'm doing for all you who, who will see me in decades and centuries from now just try and what you, you all are doing you can achieve you can do amazing great things and I hope by this time whoever's watching this um, that you can nod your head and say you know what dogs now are recognized as functional sentient beings dogs now have limited legal rights dogs would give their lives to save ours they would defend us to the death even though dogs don't understand death 
they would defend us to their death. We got to go back. We got to help save. Please share my work. Please subscribe to my channel, uh, my YouTube channel. Please help me spread this word. Thank you to all those people who have shared my work, uh, shared it on their Facebook. Thank you to uh, awesome massive lovers. Thank you to Peace Love Danes. Thank you for uh, New Hope for Danes. Um, thank you to these organizations uh, that have been approaching me and asking me to be in their groups and speak to uh, their members um, on their dog's behavioral issues in those groups as well. Uh, thank you to everybody who believes in everything that I'm doing. You guys are the ones who love your dogs. Thank you so much. Have a great night. Bye-bye.